you everyone for joining us today. This is the Utah League of Cities and Towns Board of Directors meeting. It is Monday, May 16th, 2022. Thank you to all of you being here. We're joined by the League Board and Executive Staff. And my name is Don Ramsey and I'm privileged to serve as President of the Board this year. Um, the first thing on our agenda that we have uh, is a public hearing regarding our 2023 tentative budget, fiscal year 23 uh, budget. Um, I'm going to first turn staff and see if there are presentations. Anything else you'd like to, to go over prior to opening this for public comment and public hearing? The one thing, Mary, I'll, I'll note is we are going to do a public hearing in this meeting and in June. So this, this will, we'll need a motion to open the public hearing for a comment on the tentative budget. Um, then after we close it, we'll go through the tentative budget proposal later in the meeting. Take feedback from the board, make any potential modifications, and then bring it back on June 13th for approval. So this will be one of two opportunities for the public if they so choose to chime in on the board or on the budget. And the budget was posted last week. Last week. Yep. So now it'll be out, and that's why we'll do a second hearing right. in June, right. so as to meet the timing requirement. Right. Well, and we, we do want feedback. We want feedback on this. We'll have the opportunity. Um, as has been said, for uh, the board to weigh in, to ask questions, and also for the public. And if there are questions that the public might have today to help lead a more informed uh, question and answer even next time, please feel free to weigh in and listen to what's said today, and then um, we'll have another opportunity next time. <coughs> I'm going to open the public hearing. Uh, so sure. Chair, yeah. so uh, Jeff Silvestri, okay. I will make a motion to open the public hearing on the proposed uh, budget. For so year 2023. Thank you. Can I get a second? second? Thank you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor of opening the public hearing on our fiscal year 23 tentative budget, please say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, we will now open the public hearing. And we don't have any members of the public here with us in person today, so I'm going to ask if you'll look online and see if there are any members of the public here. Online, if you would like to say anything, please turn on your camera and give us a wave or raise your hand electronically. Yep. They raise their hand. Uh, we can go ahead and follow them. Uh, last call. Try to make sure that we get adequate time for people to weigh in. I'm not seeing any. Okay, if there's no public comment, um, we will make a motion to close the public hearing. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. The public hearing is closed. And, uh, keep in mind, if anybody watches this later or listens to this later, there will be another opportunity to weigh in. We'll have more information to come. Okay, uh, there isn't any other action we need to take on that right now, right? No. Nope. Let's move on to item three. Okay, administrative item. Um, we need an approval, a motion to approve the minutes, uh, which were sent out, the draft minutes of our April 20th, 2022 meeting. They were sent out. Is there anybody who has any questions, comments, or amendments to the minutes? Move to approve the minutes as submitted. Thank Second. you. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes as they've been submitted. Any discussion? All right, seeing none, all in favor of approving the draft from our April 20th, 2022 minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Those minutes are approved, thank you. Also a call for any conflict of interest forms. Uh, we do this every meeting. If you have anything uh, to report, we ask you fill out one of the conflict of interest forms and make sure to submit those to us. So if you have those, take those. That would be great. May I take a moment on this item real quick just to Absolutely. outline the key objectives for the meeting? Yep. So thank you everybody who's joined us in person and remotely. We, just to make sure everyone's on the same page here, uh, here are the main objectives of the, the rest of the meeting. Number one, you'll consider the tentative league budget. And we've dedicated uh, significant time on the agenda for that consideration. Again, final the final budget will come before you on June 13th. 
Uh, second, we're 245 days away from the legislative session. Uh, for some of us, it already feels like it's here because we'll be at the Capitol most of the week for legislative interim meetings. Uh, we, we will lay out to you the action plan to date. As part of that, we have found the focus groups that we've held within the board meetings the last two months to be very insightful. And so we had, we've had a question on the agenda for the last two meetings that we didn't get to as part of that board focus group that we will be addressing today about the methodology on modern income housing. So we'll set that up uh, later in the agenda and then time permitting, get to the second discussion item around drought and water conservation measures recognizing that if we run out of time before that question, that will be the focus group question for the board in June. Uh, so though we have a few other things like boards and commissions and the, uh, and the audit assessment, fraud assessment from the auditor's office to do as well, but those are the, those are the two biggest objectives for the next uh, hour and 45 minutes. So Great. thank you, Mark. Thank you, appreciate it, Cameron. Thank you to you and to the staff and all the work we've done in preparing for today. We appreciate it. And again, thank you all of you for being here with us. Uh, in person. It's nice to see those of you in person and those of you online. Um, thank you. Nice to see your names at least. Thanks for being here. Okay, hey, item four, we're going to turn to Liam Trail Hill, our legislative research analyst, to talk about our board. Where are we at? What are we still Where are we at? We got, at? we got a lot to fill. We got a lot to do. So we had solicited a lot of applications for um, multiple board and commission vacancies that we had both that were just vacant and then new boards and commissions from this last legislative session. Last month, we filled some for the Joint Highway Committee and decided to um, get more applications for the boards and commissions that are listed in your board memo. And we have staff recommendations for the following vacancies with the following individuals to fill them. So staff recommends that the board approve the following individuals to fill the vacancies. For the point of the Mountain Development Commission, Sandy Mayor Monica Zoltansky. For the WFRC Regional Growth Committee, Bluffdale Mayor Natalie Hall. For the Land Conservation Board, um, it is in statute that we submit a list to the governor. So we have that list of six there to submit to the governor for his approval. For the Cybersecurity Commission, Kaysville Mayor Tammy Tran. The Utah State Scenic Byway Committee, Farmington Council Member Amy Shumway. For the Unmanned Aircraft Working Group, Kaysville Council Member Abby Hunt. For the USU Land, Water, and Air Advisory Committee, also Kaysville Council Member Abby Hunt. For the Rural Online Hubs um, no. Advisory, oops, sorry. For the Rural, the rural One Unit, I can't remember. Is that what I, what did I say? Yeah, he's he's oh, yeah. 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 Jeez, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the rural online hub anti council member Deb Killian. And then I did admit putting a name on the memo, but I have it listed in that first list for the Criminal Justice Data Management Task Force is Saratoga Springs City Manager Mark Christensen. End list. Thank you. Can I ask a question? How many did the governor get to pick from the land conservation? Board? Yes, there are two openings on the land conservation board one of which cannot be from a county of the first or second class. But there are two vacancies on that one. And that's replacing the Quality Growth Commission. For what it's worth, I did not know that Tish Baroker's name was Letitia or Letitia. <laughs> I've only ever referred to her as Tish and I've never, I'm looking at that going, that's not right. Oh, well, maybe that is her, actually her. Name. She did okay. put on there, Tish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, she does by interesting, okay. Mayor Walker has uh, an address online. All right, great. Hi, thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. What? Tell me about the Point of the Mountain Development Commission's uh, committee. I, I guess I wasn't aware we had someone on that. I, what? What? Tell me about that position. Yes. So the Point of the Mountain Development Commission is evaluating, studying, preparing reports, and making recommendations concerning future planning in the project area. A lot of it had to do with coordinating um, with other stakeholders for transportation infrastructure, whether it was local governments, WFRCs, MAG, UDOT, UTA, um, and, and just identifying transportation needs. It doesn't have any effect on local land use authority, um, but it does make those sort of recommendations and advising statements um, 
for those that do make this decision. But it's, it's an advising. Who was who was on it before? Uh, who was the uh, Sandy Mayor before? Mayor okay, Mayor Bradford. Yep. Okay. All right. That might explain why I never saw any of the deals. But um, so this person works with the WFRC and then integrates with the Point Commission. Is that the way it works? No. This person isn't working for WFRC. Oh no. No, this is Troy, this is the Point of the Mountain Commission that existed before the Land Authority existed. The Point of the Mountain Commission oh, is that okay. Point of the Mountain yeah. Commission. Gotcha. I okay, I know. I'm, All right, I'm sorry. Not sure what what work they're still doing? I don't know, but because okay, they're not gotcha. actually advising the Land Commission, so I don't know exactly what the what the Point of the Mountain Commission is still doing. Except I think that they're just working in a larger regional capacity and it was started you know it, was, it came on board i think lowry still chairs that it started as a result of the Utah work that was done all in preparation for where, where things are at now and that's what this is that commission is still functioning although i, I don't know exactly what it is that they're working on i think i've been on that commission for 10 years but i <laughs> I, I, I moved to i moved to approve this list could i make a comment please this is Council Member McKay. Yes, go ahead. Um, I know that Mayor Natalie Hall from Bluffdale had reached out to me, and I know that she was going to apply for the Wasatch Front Regional Council, but also Point of the Mountain. And I know she feels like her city, even though they border the Point of the Mountain project, she does not sit on any committees that has any say on this. And I know that that Point of the Mountain one was her first choice. Um, for a committee that she could serve on. And I feel like where it borders her city that they should have some say. So I don't know if that, you know, is, is still up for debate, um, but I know she was really hopeful to be on that point of the mountain. Do you want me to answer that, uh, Yeah, go ahead, please. No, thank you, council member. We had multiple applications for this one position. And so as we were evaluating uh, for our staff recommendation, felt like there was some importance in having that continuity, knowing that the Sandy Mayor had, had or the previous Sandy Mayor had served on this commission, knowing that it's moving to the point where you're seeing not just the development of that 700 acres, but you're seeing that regional coordination that we felt like there was value in that continuity uh, rather than having a different city take that one spot. Again, we had multiple cities I think we had six applicants for that one. Um, so our recommendation was to pick the continuity over a over a new city. Ultimately, it is this board's call. Uh, that's why we bring the recommendations back to the board. Um, and that's why we <coughs> recommended Mayor Hall for regional growth. So as to elevate Bluffdale City uh, in, in the overall conversation regionally, uh, but just to stick with the continuity with the Point of the Mountain Development Commission. Tell me if I can. I was also um, really supportive of having Mayor Hall take that spot on regional growth and having uh, Bluffdale take that spot. I will tell you, um, from the land authority point, which is not the commission, the commission is separate from the land authority, but from the land authority point, we have several subcommittees, several, and Bluffdale's mayor before served on at least one of the subcommittees. And so I would imagine that that spot is still the mayor of Bluffdale's spot. Um, but I'm happy to reach out to Alan Matheson and find out and ask him to follow up and to follow up with Mayor Hall to make sure that she is serving on a subcommittee of the Point of the Mountain State Land Authority. That sounds good. I just I just feel like Bluffdale would have more of an interest than Sandy that's, you know, up a the road a little bit from this. So I don't know. I would I would still propose that Mayor Hall um, get to serve in that position. I think that it affects their city a lot. As it's not a one, decision that this isn't a committee that's making decisions about what's happening. No, and, yeah, one, one other clarification about this commission versus the other point of the mountain is that the this development commission is a coordinating body for all of the cities within the 20,000 acres of what I'll refer to as the glorified point of the mountain. So Sandy <laughs> is in that is in that footprint. Um, there are multiple cities that are that are in that footprint. So it's not you're right, it's not directly adjacent to the point like Bluffdale is, but it is within the geographic boundary of this commission. This commission does not have land use authority. You know, this commission is a coordinating body as opposed to the 700 acre commission, 
which Mayor Walker sits on that as well, representing Draper, um, that's actually making decisions as opposed to the coordinating convening body. And Sandy is within that glorified point of the mountain radius. But again, it's up to this board if you want to proceed with um, the Point of the Mountain Development Commission as recommended, or if you want us to pull that one and bring it back another time. <clears throat> So this is Jeff Silverstrini. I actually, uh, wearing my other hat as West Exmont Regional Council Chair, I was looking forward to having Mayor Hall on regional growth. Um, and, and part of that is because Bluffdale still has a potential for a lot more growth. And uh, that, you know, if we have to like shift Mayor Zoltansky to that one, I actually think that Mayor Hall might, she may not realize it, but she might be better situated for our city on, on regional growth. I actually felt the same way because the, the point of the Mountain Commission, as has been said, is not making decisions about what happens at the point. Um, but the subcommittees that, that I'll check with Alan and make sure that she's on, which she should be, and, and where uh, Timothy was before, um, does have more of an input in um, making recommendations and help make recommendations as to what's directly happening at the point. So that opportunity already exists there for Bluffdale, and I, and I agree, just looking at the entirety of Bluffdale, I think having them serve on the Regional Growth Committee is- Yeah, the, the, the point of the Mountain Commission is so effective, it has so much say, I forgot about it. That's how, uh, <laughs> that's how awesome that committee is, Tawny. She's better off on the Regional Growth Committee, frankly, but- Hey, sounds good. I trust you, Mayors, thank you. Yeah, no, and thank you. Um, oh, yeah. I think we all agree that that's the case. But I, as I said, I'll make sure to reach out to Alan Matheson and have him reach out to her and make sure that she is. And she may already know that she is. She may have already started participating. I don't know. But I'll make sure that she is on that subcommittee. I don't know which one it is. There's five or six subcommittees. But I'll make sure she's on there and she has that voice and that say. Sounds great. Thank you, Mayor Ramsey. Yeah. Okay, with that, we do have a motion by Mayor Walker to approve this list. Um, I'll second the motion. I don't know if it's been seconded. It hasn't been. Okay. Is there any additional discussion? Question? Yeah. I would just like to clarify this the list that is here <coughs> in addition to the name that yeah, was left. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yes. So we're going to assume, Mayor Walker, that your motion includes this list plus the one name that was uh, just accidentally. Yes. Okay. And yes. Still stands with your second as well. Yeah. Motion okay. stands with that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, all in favor of approving this list with the one name that was also um, just omitted by accident, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks. All right. Okay, we're going to turn it over to Nick Jarvis, our Chief Operating Officer. We have um, a fraud risk assessment from the Office of the State Auditor that we're going to let. It gets the really fun work. It's awesome. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the uh, progress assessment from the Office of the State Auditor. Every public entity is required to uh, complete and submit this every year. Um, we have a uh, score of the highest of the low, uh, low fraud risk. Um, so one more point, and then we're into that very low category. Um, and you can see it's included in your packet. Uh, the things that we do have that uh, score up the points for this somewhat arbitrary number, um, and then also the separation of duties as well. The one thing I'd like to point out this year um, that we can improve on for next year is um, the one we don't have checked off is having the governing body members complete entity specific uh, training. Now, um, we will post some links. I know you uh, complete this training for your individual municipalities. We'll get some uh, training links out to folks uh, for local districts specifically or in local districts specifically. Um, and then we would like to, for the fiscal year 2023 uh, round when we do this, uh, be able to have the board chair confirm and certify that uh, our board has completed those, those trainings that are available at the state auditor. And with that, in the next year, we'll jump up into that very low category um, and happy to answer any questions uh, regarding uh, this process and, and what we uh, do to make sure that we have a low probability for fraud. How long does the training take? 
you know? Sorry? Just because I have so many trains. I know. Online, I'm so <laughs> um, I would have to look into it. We'll, we'll send out some more information. Um, and I do need to look if they have interlocal specific training because there are so few of us. Um, we're wondering if it could, uh, the board chair could just certify that you've completed this training via the training that you've done for your city. So we're going to look a little more into that and we have a whole year in order to get that in order, but just wanted to um, make sure everyone was aware of that now. So Nick, local district training doesn't count. Does not. Does not count. A look, I, I will have to, since we haven't filled this out, I'll check out what counts exactly. But really it's the it's the training of the office that the that you're required to do within your cities. Um, I need, just need to make sure if they've made any changes to interlocal, or we can reach out to the uh, auditor's office to see does this count if they do it for their cities. And then we would just have the board chair certify that our board has done it. And then we're then we're looking even better. We're looking good now, we're looking even better next year when we do this. My, my guess would be almost everyone serves on some local district and mm -hmm. has got that certificate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In fact, maybe we should send those to you. Yeah. Yep. If you so if you have if you do have a certification, um, we can this was something that kind of came up as we're looking like what, what can we do to get better? So we haven't really put the plan of attack uh, together yet. But yeah, I think that would be I'll send out an email letting everyone know where they could find the training if they've already completed it, etc. Um, and then we'll we'll know for next fiscal year that we'll be looking good to move into that very low category. Okay. Thanks. There's nothing else you need to do though today. Uh, just to approve this, and then we'll get it filed with the auditor's office, and uh, we'll be good to go. Okay. We'll go approve it. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you. Any additional discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, Cam and Nick, um, our fiscal year 2023 tentative budget. Thank, Thank you, Mayor. What we have for your consideration today is the tentative budget. I will take a moment to highlight key pieces on the revenue side, and then Nick will highlight a few key pieces on the expenditure side. And then we welcome your feedback and direction uh, with the final budget coming before you on Monday, June 13th. So first, you'll see that we are we are projecting, we're proposing, excuse me, a budget of a little over three and a half million dollars, um, of which a large chunk, uh, nearly three hundred and or three hundred twenty-eight thousand five hundred dollars, is from grants and special projects. So you may recall from the December board meeting when we accepted a grant from Intermountain and Zions Bank uh, to help cities manage public assets of that is a significant portion of those grants and special projects. So that's one-time money. And then there's $159,000 from, from reserves, which is also one-time money. I'll come back to, to those in a moment. For the general revenue, uh, we are projecting or proposing a budget with revenue that um, is an increase over last year. Um, that is in part due to the natural increase in the dues formula and in part because of the vote you cast in April to slightly increase the sales tax component of our three-tiered formula. As a reminder, the three tiers of our, there are the three legs of our formula stool, our sales tax, assessed value of property and population in any given city. And so we made that small adjustment to the sales tax piece to generate some additional revenue. And Nick will talk briefly um, in a moment about how, we're, how we are planning to utilize those dollars. The board also set the goal uh, at the April meeting of the 95% threshold. Nick and I have probably spent, uh, we probably used the term 95% more in the last few weeks than the rest of our careers combined. But for the first time, the league board has now given us that direction of dues need to cover 95% of non-conference um, expenses, which means the conferences need to generate additional revenue to cover that additional 5% of non-conference operations and personnel as well as pay for the conferences themselves. And so what we are, that goal goes into effect next year. So this budget before you does not hit the 95%, but it moves the needle closer to the 95%. Um, it also includes the ARPA dollars that we have one more year of 
from the voluntary assessment. And I was going to reference this later in the meeting, but Mayor Ramsey, Mayor Silvestrini, uh, Liam Meg Ryan, and I spent last Wednesday evening or Tuesday evening in Richfield with uh, Councilmember Lynch and over almost 200 city officials from Central Utah. And Liam was extremely popular because uh, the <laughs> ARPA expertise and was fielding questions from communities across the region on ARPA. So still very a very valuable asset and resource for for our communities. I'll yeah, talk but if I can yeah, just ahead. say for the rest of the board, th th I think it was a this it was an amazing opportunity to connect with uh, uh, not just uh, the people that normally come to our conferences, but with with uh, council members and staff from various cities in the five county region. I thought it was terrific. Uh, we spent basically it was like a three hour conference and went to different. Uh, uh, we all tried to spread, you know, split up and go to different things. So we got as, as much exposure to the issues down there as we could. But um, I thought it was very, a very good thing to do. And I learned a lot from interacting with council members from Richfield and uh, all over the place, right? Yeah. All, over, all over down there. So it was a good thing to do. That was very well done and very well received. It was it was a terrific event. So, Mayors, thank you for both being willing to, to join us down there. And the league was the primary sponsor of that event in partner. And the leg work was all done by the six county AOG. So they put on the event, we sponsored it, and it was it was a tremendous, tremendous evening. Uh, so I bring that up in the context of ARPA that that uh, that value is still being very much realized. When it comes back to the, the budget, you can see in the memo, letter A shows that proposed increase of revenue, uh, which projecting into next year, we would still need an additional modification to do to hit the 95% threshold. But this year is a very positive step toward that threshold. Letter B is what I referenced about the grant and special project revenue. Um, don't be fooled by that 2,000% increase number because that is simply a reflection that we received the grant this year and we didn't have it last year. And then letter C is on the reserves. And for those of you who are new to the board, the league board a few years ago uh, created a fund balance policy. And so what we've done with our reserves is making sure that we are consistent with that policy of having between 25 and 50% in our fund balance. We're currently projecting that to be 40% going into next year with this buy down. And what this also does is it allows us to delay the full request of a dues increase because we have this one-time money. And this one-time money is really the fruit of Katie's labors when she kept sponsors with the league despite a year of no conferences. Um, so that's where you're seeing that, that one-time money being put to good effect. The last thing I'll add on the revenue side before I turn it over to Nick on the expenditures is that this does, we, we had a subgroup of board members who met in late March to discuss the potential membership of Metro Townships in Salt Lake County. That subcommittee was very supportive of proceeding, asked us to follow up with all of the league member cities who have Metro Townships on their borders. Uh, so we followed up with Salt Lake City, we followed up with Sandy City, West Jordan City, Taylorsville City. Um, I, I don't think I'm missing any league members uh, the, that have a Metro Township. And every one of the cities said we're fine with the Metro Townships uh, proceeding. So we did not budget for them to come on, but we are informing them that, uh, that they are welcome to join the league and, and that would be added to our base going forward. So we're hoping we can get them for this year, but we didn't want to budget for them in case they weren't prepared to, um, to join the league financially yet this year. And so I just wanted to clarify that piece and, and give the board one last chance to, to opine on the Metro Township piece before we send, before we follow up on the invoices there. Have you had any feedback from, uh, from the from cities basically about the invoices that were sent out so far? Yeah, so the Mayor Silvestrini asked if we've had any feedback from cities. Uh, we've had a couple of cities who asked for additional context for why the amount had increased this year. We sent the we sent an email and we sent uh, via normal mail a letter from me that was signed by the officers. In addition to that, we sent our, our yearly report from last year so as to show the work um, of what's happening 
There was one city uh, whose mayor was initially displeased. I followed up with that city with the proposed budget. Uh, and I'm cautiously optimistic that that city will still indeed uh, participate um, in the league. Uh, also, I've been trying to have a sit down meeting with leadership in, in West Valley City. So stay tuned on, on that one. If you need any assistance, let us know. Any questions for me on the revenue side before I turn it over to Nick to hit the highlights on the expenditure side? All right, thank you, Cam. Uh, so we'll move this over to the expense end of things. As you'll see in your memo, uh, personnel expenses is the uh, largest area of increase. Um, as we've uh, talked about in our meetings leading up to this, we've uh, added uh, additional bandwidth to our legislative team and the team overall. Uh, we've created a position. We've um, had, had uh, merit-based and market-based uh, raises planned for the upcoming year. Um, and then we also have significant investment in contract labor uh, to help uh, augment the legislative team's efforts on, on the Hill. So you'll see there is a... Uh, a little over 12% increase to that portion of the budget. When we get to our operations and engagement section, you'll see there is a, four, uh, a little over 14% reduction in this side of things. Um, this is due to some cost savings that we found and brought those down long term. Uh, but the major reason for this is because we're in a, a quote unquote off year. So this year coming up is not uh, an election year. We won't be producing the directory, the powers and duties. We won't be having uh, elected officials essentials as well. Um, and so we'll see kind of, you'll see a two year cycle of when the operations costs come down a little um, and then back up once we have to hold those events and create those publications. Over to events. Um, you'll see we have uh, a major increase in the facility and special rental, uh, special equipment rental portion. That uh, is post pandemic uh, inflation, costs going up with everything surrounding the hospitality and, and conference and event industry. Um, so we've seen those increases uh, in this current fiscal year. We're planning for them in the next fiscal year. Uh, but we would like the board just to be aware that that is an area where we think we'll see additional increases as the years go on. Uh, they'll be charging more for those types of things. Um, you'll see an order in uh, an effort to make sure we're not uh, just increasing this entire events uh, portion of a lot or having to increase significantly the registration fees that we charge. As Cam mentioned, we do need a portion of this uh, revenue associated with this section to help fund our other operations. Um, we've shifted a lot of money from our, our convention programming into that uh, facility and special equipment rental. This number that we budgeted for is slightly lower uh, than what we've uh, spent this year so far. Um, but we are budgeting accordingly as we've looked at each event on what types of speakers and stuff we're going to bring in. Um, and then lastly, we've got our grants and special projects section. Uh, the big portion of that is that your land, your plan, public asset uh, program. And we are currently budgeting that $217,500 there. Uh, but we are still working that out exactly how much we plan to spend in this first year of the program. But that is entirely funded by that $500,000 grant uh, from Inter Mountain over the next couple of years. Uh, then ultimately, we, we bring uh, to you a, a balanced budget here of a little over $3.5 million, including that uh, reserve and special uh, grant and special project revenue. Happy to answer any questions about any particular uh, areas where we uh, increase or decrease. And just any other uh, questions the board may have. Any questions? Do not see a hand or a chat online. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, at this point, any discussion? Any anything else? We've gone 
We've spent a lot of time. Actually, I think we've been pretty involved in this for the last few months. We've made a lot of decisions, a lot of decisions that have um, guided to where this budget has, has ended up, what it looks like, and what our objectives are, and how we intend to hope to pay for them. You know, uh, what are we've made some good decisions, some big decisions, uh, some hard decisions, right? If there's no other questions, I'm going to ask if there's a motion to approve the tentative budget for fiscal year 2020. I'll make that motion. Um, on here it says, oh, this, oh sorry, I was looking at the wrong agenda item. Yes, I'm like, it should say 23. I was looking at risk, risk assessment <laughs> year. I'm like, I know it should say 23. <laughs> okay, thank you. We have a motion to approve the tentative budget for our. Um, 2023 fiscal year. I'll second. Motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Waiting just a second to see if there's anything online. Okay, seeing none, all in favor of approving the budget that's been presented, a tentative budget for the fiscal year 2023, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Great. Thank you. Appreciate Ooh, that. Uh, motion. Sorry. I know that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move on to item seven then. Perfect. It's always, I, I marvel that there's never very much public comment about budgets. There can be a lot of public comment about a lot of things, but budgets tend to be one that there's not as much public input about maybe. For All right, city for this All right, item seven advocacy and engagement updates. We're going to turn to our staff, several people on the staff. I'm not sure. Cam, I'm going to yep, start well, with you and let you run through everybody who's going to make a presentation here and update us. Perfect. Well, I'll make a comment on the budget, and that's just first an expression of appreciation on behalf of our whole team because the budget, the tentative budget that you approved, I think is a, a really powerful sign of confidence that you have in the organization and in us as a team uh, to execute on some really important policy issues that matter to all of your cities, regardless of your size. Uh, I also have been really humbled and excited over these last few weeks as we were meeting with people to see how much enthusiasm there is in city halls around the state right now about working together on on big ticket policy items. And I think that was my biggest takeaway from mid-year is we have a lot of really talented, capable mayors and council members, regardless of if they've been in office for six months or six decades, that they're ready to tackle big issues. And we feel more equipped now than ever before to help you as mayors and council members tackle these big issues. So that is uh, as the setup. Here's what we hope to accomplish over the next hour. I'll turn it over in a moment to Justin and to the rest of the policy team to lay out where we're at currently with our proposed plan of attack. And they'll provide that context for all the different policy issues, the different groups that are occurring, that are that are meeting, including the Unified Economic Opportunity Commission and Commission on Housing Affordability. After they provide the context for what we as staff are recommending that we prioritize as of May 16th at 12.47 p.m., right? Um, it could change the next 10 minutes. Yeah, it could. It could. This is why we have uh, smartphones, is because priorities change like that. Um, after they set the context, then we'll come back for a discussion as a whole mm -hmm. about discussion item number one and time for main discussion item number two. Discussion item number one being around housing and methodologies for the sufficient promotion and production of modern income housing and you know, what our role as cities is in that in that process. So Justin, I'll turn it over to you for the context and then we'll come back to further discussion. Okay, thank you so much. So I'd start out with, um, you, if you haven't seen the memo yet, it's up there, kind of the, the outline that we're gonna, it's almost a separate agenda. So sorry for that. You thought we were to item seven and we're going back to number one here um, in, in a completely separate thing here. Um, but uh, talking about how we're, how we're setting priorities, and this is probably not a shocker to anyone, but we don't have the full picture of what every priority and what every legislative issue is going to be this year. So kind of going to walk through the process about how we're going to get there um, and, and how, how we're going to figure out what it is we're going to focus on this year. 
Um, so you saw it um, when we met a couple of months ago um, and in the last couple of board meetings, we had a very long list um, where we just kind of threw all the ideas on there. Here's the universe of everything we might deal with this year. We got some feedback, for example, Gary Hill brought up cemeteries as something to look at. So we have a long list. And then as, and as you all know, we had Cox's at our, at our mid-year conference. Uh, we put out a survey uh, and then we've talked to a lot of external groups. Um, so we're gonna go through and, and share um, what we heard through all of the caucus meetings first uh, to give a little context for those discussions that we had. Um, I know most of you were in a caucus meeting, but nobody was in all the caucus meetings. So we'll have Molly go through and talk a little bit about what we threw out of those caucus meetings, which will help inform my priorities. And then Carson's gonna talk about uh, what we heard from the follow-up survey. Uh, so we'll, we'll go in that order, Molly and then Carson. And you can find both of their memos in the war packet. Uh, Carson's uh, is about page 35, Molly's about page 20. Excellent. Perfect. Well, as many of you know, we tackled two big topics, uh, growth and water, in our caucus meeting. We had five caucuses that were largely self-selected. Um, we had our big cities for second class, established mid-size, resort, rural, and rapid growth. Um, cities, we kind of have some guidelines on this, but really folks kind of self-selected as to where, where they wanted to go and where they thought it would be helpful. Um, within growth, we really discussed what does a successful conversation look like? And we got a lot of kind of universal feedback throughout all of the caucuses, regardless of size, um, using mindful rhetoric, uh, recognizing nuance to NIMBY, and that, you know, if folks are averse or even anti-growth, um, recognizing that there is some kind of validity to that with, with their quality of life. Um, one is a big one that came up again and again was really we need to establish a clear understanding of what it is we're talking about and expectations. Um, oftentimes when we talk about growth, which is a very nebulous topic, we don't really know where the terminal is. And so it's hard then for us to figure out what exactly we are all doing because it's like, well, I contributed this, so why should I have to do more? You know, trying to figure out exactly what it is when we're talking about these things. What do we mean when we say density? Uh, what do we mean when we say balance? Right now, there aren't really set definitions on a lot of the vernacular we throw around. And so folks are just kind of able to impose their own definition and interpretation on it. So we're not really having the same conversation. Um, a big one was maintaining common values. This goes into what uh, Envision Utah was working on. I think another big one was what kind of envision, how can we get folks to envision a realistic version of growth within your community? Like what could growth realistically look like in your community in a way that maintains or even enhances the sense of place that is there? Um, I, a big one is again, identifying benefits and costs and being transparent with what those are and really open with that. And then examining our kind of divergent values that do come along with that. Um, so when I was reading through all this, it really reminded me of something uh, to get a little ivory tower on it, which is essentially we need to establish a discourse community, which is a group of people who have similar values, similar goals, similar vernacular, right? And how we can all engage in this communication together. Uh, the example I use is that Jim is very into the NBA and I am very not into the NBA. So when he talks about like missing shots from downtown, I have no idea, like I assume it's something to do with traffic, um, <laughs> but I'm not fully sure. And so really kind of figuring out how can we, you know, really make sure that we have the same values, we have the same goals, we are establishing, again, like this common vernacular so that when we all come to the table to have this conversation, we are actually in the same discourse community and engaging with one another on the topics instead of me talking about what my notion of growth is and Carson talking about what his notion of growth is and completely going past each other. Um, so there's more on that, but you can read it if you want. We can touch base offline. I know we have a lot to get to. Um, and then with water, really, it was impressive. There's really kind of fell into three broad categories of, of tactics that cities were taking, challenges and opportunities that were out there with policies, um, ordinances, anything like that. And then just kind of obvious values that we wanna maintain like bulk of control, anything like that. Um, for the sake of time, I won't dig, dig too far into those. Um, one thing that I did notice that I think is interesting and we've kind of been talking about is 
as we talk about water and we talk about growth, when do these issues need to be discussed together, hand in hand, and when do they need to be bifurcated, right? And like we're talking about one or talking about the other. Um, so that's kind of one thing we were considering, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for caucuses. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, Carson, uh, so as you know, we, we had caucus discussions and then right after uh, the conference, we sent out a follow-up survey uh, to, to, the, to everybody to find out uh, some of their priorities and where we should prioritize everything. So let Ca Carson walk through that. Thanks, Justin and Molly. Um, yeah, to kind of build off of that, we so we had these conversations in sort of a focus group style in the caucuses at New Year, and then we wanted to, um, in, in sort of our uh, planning for this interim process, we wanted to make sure we were collecting data points from multiple areas, not just from mid-year attendees, for example, so broaden the sample. And so that was part of the thought process that went through the survey. As we were building the survey, we sort of knew what to expect. So it was almost more hypothesis testing than actual um, information collection. But we, we left options open for people to provide additional feedback. So you know, the off chance that we're wrong, we will quickly catch that. So we received about 47 responses on the survey, a little bit lower than normal, but we feel pretty confident with these results, given that we tested a lot of these same questions in other venues. And so our actual uh, sample universe looks a lot bigger if we can kind of pull this together. So. Um, so the first part of the survey was this budgeting activity. We provided 10 different areas where uh, survey respondents, and I know some of you took the survey, so appreciate your time. Um, and we asked survey respondents to just rank these and said, you have $100, you can't spend any more than that, but spend these $100 how, you, how we should in addressing them. And there's a couple of different categories thrown in there. And so it gets a little bit, um, we don't want to read too much into details, but this kind of gives us an idea of where our uh, survey respondents would invest their resources where they in that in our, in our shoes. So, so is this in chronological order then that list you have? Is that so the most votes was housing and the least votes were public safety? Uh, those are just the order that it came up in. Okay. But this will this graph will show it. So and this is just kind of a box and Mr. Graph to kind of show both the, the general responses but then also the variation because we saw with public safety, for example, there was Overall, did not rank as high as some of the other ones, but there were a few people who ranked it like they would draw almost all of their resources into public safety. Um, so that kind of gives us a sense there. And then, um, yeah, we, it just, I think overall this shows that the survey supports our, our hypothesis or our expectations going in that housing and land use, water, and um, the general revenue streams were the overall top priorities. It's not everybody's top priority, but Overall, that's where people would invest the most resources on average. And a lot of those are interconnected, like Molly said. We still have some conversations to go on how we want to address water and growth and all these different pieces in tandem because they're, um, you know, in some instances, uh, instances have to be siloed to address, and other times we need to make sure that we're talking about them in conjunction. So, this was the budget activity. There's a lot more um, detail in the packet. And I'm happy to answer questions too if you have them. The other piece I just want to mention briefly is the qualitative responses, um, where we. Carson, you think just yeah. leave that here? I think this is easier for people to see. So just let let people. Can you just maybe read out what those are? Yeah. So this was a breakdown of elected and staff. Sorry, the order changes on the horizontal axis. Excel does that with the uh, with um, the charts for some reason, but. Yeah, so public safety, for example, elected officials tended to rank that higher than staff. Um, there wasn't a huge, like public safety is the biggest area where there's a change between public elected officials and other, other public officials. Um, we saw some variation in all these other categories, but the quick, by far away the biggest one was public safety. Um, yeah, I think land use, maybe because a lot of these issues were a little bit more technical. We're trying to still draw a little bit of a separation there between items that one use task force might traditionally address, and then some more uh, housing policy centered items which fall into land use but are more um, focused on the matter of getting people housed than changing ordinances. Are there any questions about this overall? The key takeaways are yeah, housing, land use, water. Transportation really kind of driving the narrative. And this is broken down by individual classification of the city. 
I'll say that towns have a pretty small, I think only four people from towns fill this particular survey out. So I wouldn't rely too heavily on it, but we we wanted to just include it as a factor to consider. Among those four, water did rank a lot higher than almost any other category within that group. So I thought that was interesting, but similar to what we've heard from both the rural caucus and some other groups where that conversation is had. And yeah. Okay, great. Any questions for for Carson or Molly there? Oh, I can go quickly on the oh yeah, go on the free responses. Yeah. So let me ask similar conversation. There are similar questions to what we asked in the caucuses. So a lot of this will really just reflect what Molly already talked about. But there were a couple of themes that were repeated across uh, water transportation and housing, and those were that we need state resources for technical assistance. We all know that we got a lot of money last year, but I think the need is still there. Uh, second is that we need the state level infrastructure investment and we also need tools for local governments to invest in infrastructure in a greater capacity, educating the public on everything from water conservation to housing to yeah, pretty much everything in the, in the universe. Um, and then lastly, uh, respecting the role of local governments. Those kind of four themes were in all of these different categories that we asked the funds about. And again, not unexpected, but I think it's important for us to bear in mind as we go forward. Okay, thank you, Carson. All right, any questions on any of that? Um, if you haven't read it yet, um, both Molly and Carson have the memos in the board packet. They go more into depth and in, into into all of this. So I encourage you to read though. There's some there's some great stuff in there. Uh, Molly and Carson have done a phenomenal job uh, aggregating that information. Um, one of the things that we've we've done is we actually took uh, what we heard from the caucuses. And, and by we, I say I was there and Molly presented it because she actually knows what's going on with it. But uh, we actually talked with Laura Hansen uh, at GOPB um, and, and spent about an hour talking with her about the growth issues. And then she she liked it so much, they invited, uh, invited Molly to come back and present again to a larger discussion on this. And then last Friday, we went down and met with the Division of Water Resources and shared what we heard on water and they were extremely invested in everything we had to say. Um, we thought it was gonna be a quick five minute overview of what we heard. And we were, ended up going about line by line through the entire discussion, spent about an hour with them as well. So we're out there sharing this information, not just with you, uh, but also sharing it with these other agencies uh, that, are, that are also very involved in this. Uh, and that leads to the next, uh, the next issue is we're looking at how we prioritize everything. Mm -hmm. It's as much as we would like to think that we are totally masters of our own fate. Uh, when it comes to setting legislative priorities. We know there are other people in this space, other entities, other committees uh, that we're going to have to uh, deal with, for lack of a better term, um, or, or work with to be more optimistic. Um, but just want to make sure everyone's aware of some of those groups. Uh, so GOPB is doing their uh, public engagement. So that's uh, Governor's Office of Planning and Budget um, are, are doing their public engagement effort on growth. And we've been involved in those meetings. We'll continue talking with them. Uh, that's something that our member prioritized a year ago is having, a, as we surveyed last summer, having a statewide conversation on growth. And I know we talked about that in mid-year and we're continuing to work with them. And that's where we presented, um, I guess that was just a week ago, uh, talking about what happened in our caucus discussion. Uh, the other committees we want to talk about, and we, we have talked about a lot and we will continue talking about, is the UEOC, the Unified Economic Opportunity Commission. Uh, this is the, the commission that Mayor Ramsey sits on. Um, and just a reminder again, this is where HB 151, the Retail Incentives Bill came out of last year. Um, when we went to the first meeting of the commission here, um, they brought up that 25 bills uh, came out of the, the different subgroups and working groups from the UEOC. And, and Governor Cox in particular was very excited about continuing that level of effort going forward. Um, so this is a, a group that we want to watch closely and not only watch, but be involved with. So in the last couple of weeks, um, they have asked for our input as to individuals representing cities and towns and staff from, from the league that can be a part of their working groups. And then they also asked us and WFRC and some others for input as to what could be considered there. So in the next couple of weeks, we expect that to clarify a little bit more and we'll see um, what the next HB 151 is uh, that we'll, we'll spend our time on, as well as uh, other issues that we expect them. But that's a group that, that sort of flew under the radar last year. Um, we were obviously very involved with that one bill, 
but I, I have no um, misconceptions that they will be showing some muscle this year and trying to make some things happen. Uh, the different working groups are uh, growth and transportation, water and the environment, government efficiency, and innovation. Um, we'll be completely honest, uh, we're not sure what government efficiency or innovation are really going to look at. Um, they, they were looking for some extra groups and they found some, um, but, uh, but it's pretty clear that, that the other ones have some, have some big issues to tackle. Um, the other big thing is the Commission on Housing Affordability, the CHA, has been wrapped into the UEOC umbrella. Um, and Cam, I'm going to have you really quick. Uh, well, no, you're going to talk about it in a minute. I'll just, I, we'll jump there. But uh, big changes on the Commission on Housing Affordability. Uh, Representative Waldrop is not going to be running for election. Uh, we're, we're losing him as someone there. Uh, and Representative, or Senator Andereg, uh, who was on the CHA, has, has been uh, given a different assignment. Um, and Senator Lincoln Fillmore will now be on that. So uh, the, the tenor of the discussion, the CHA is going to change. And we're, we're going to need to be uh, ready to, to deal with that. Um, other things that you're, you're all certainly aware of, the Land Use Task Force will continue those discussions. Uh, let's say interim committees, uh, interim committees start uh, tomorrow. And so we'll see what they're all up to studying and what they're all thinking this year. And then that will help us. And then other groups, like we've mentioned, uh, Division of Natural Resources uh, and Water Resources will be very involved in different issues we're dealing with. Uh, talking about water, talking about fireworks. Uh, and then the governor's office, obviously, is the one that we're talking about. Um, and the reason, again, that we're listing all of these is just to make ourselves aware and remember that, that there's a lot of entities out there that are going to help us, whether we want them to or not, define what some of our priorities are uh, this next year. Um, Molly, let's have you take like two minutes yeah. and talk about the research we want to look at this year. Absolutely. So as we are in the interim and looking ahead to the next session, we really want to collect what data we can to tell our story. I feel like oftentimes we hear about, you know, policymaking by anecdote up on the hill, but oftentimes we kind of find ourselves defending by anecdote as well. And so there are a couple areas where we're trying to collect some data um, internally over, over the interim. Two of these are focused on housing. One is getting a good understanding of what is our current housing landscape and help articulate kind of the distribution of key metrics as we look at affordable housing, as we look at SROs, homeless shelters, anything like that. So figure out what is where. Um, additionally, with the PRC, we really want to look at this housing process. Uh, so again, like what is the process for permitting, uh, you know, getting a shovel in the ground, impact fees, anything like that, so we can have a firm understanding there. We'd like to update our cluster analysis, which establishes those kind of communities of commonality throughout the state. Um, and then we'd like to work on a bit of a state of the cities and start to build a database of some key metrics for our cities across the state. Um, I'll leave it there unless there's any questions. Oh, one thing. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, sorry. So, that's all the internal stuff. Um, externally, we're looking at partnering with the Utah Foundation on recruitment and retention for public safety, um, looking at potentially partnering with Gardner Policy Institute, we have an in-kind donation for some research with Y2 Analytics. Um, we work really closely with USU um, on their well-being project, as well as their Air, Water, and Land Institute. And we may do some other, other um, research partnered with some external folks as needed. So Molly, uh, at the last, in the last session, I thought we actually had uh, several productive meetings with the Property Rights Coalition. Mm -hmm. You know, I know it's a fluid group sometimes, but um, but I thought we had some good conversations with them that that actually helped us um, navigate at least some of the um, things that passed out of legislature with respect to stationary plans and and other housing issues. And I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity that we might even initiate to have interim conversations with the Property Rights Coalition to try to talk about what they think the issues are and, and maybe uh, have a dialogue with them like we did during the session. It'd be a lot easier to do it when we're not trying to knock heads over legislative language and, um, and we're actually talking about pure policy about what makes sense. Because I think that, that the give and take in that conversation, I, I felt like, you know, I, I had, a, I gained a better understanding of what, what some of their concerns were, and that we were also able to convey to them, like, really unintended consequences of what they were 
proposing. You know, this is why we do these things. It's not, you know, it's not just to stop you from developing in our communities. It's actually to make sure that the sewers work and things like that. So um, is there a, is there an avenue for that? Is there um Got to go? Yep. So actually the land use task force also gets underway this week. And so we will be sitting down with the representative of the PRC on Wednesday to start the conversation through the interim of their priorities and our priorities and start to see where there may be areas of consensus. Historically, the land use task force has consisted of a handful of city attorneys and then a handful of development representatives. So on, on our side, our, our representatives include people like Ryan Luce from South Jordan or Lynn Pace from Sandy or Jerry Crane from Layton or Sean Guzman from St. George. So we've got eight attorneys. What we are doing differently this year is we're trying to build out the, the back end of the land use task force because what we have found is that there are a lot of city engineers and public works professionals and others who have very valuable perspectives of that we need to be able to advocate for within the land use task force and the legislature, but we're not getting that until it's really late in the process. So we've reached out to the City Engineers Association, we've reached out to um, other groups and said, give us a couple of key names who will be your legislative liaisons with us so that we can have, we can go advocate with the PRC, but then be able to go back to essentially an internal technical team and give feedback that way. Uh, we'll have a better sense from the PRC on Wednesday what their wish list is. We still have their wish list from last spring. Uh, we decided not to put it in the package because it was a year old and I didn't want to insinuate that there were certain things that they still wanted to do. Uh, we'll have a better sense after Wednesday of, of what's on their list. Yeah, but as we had conversations in the car coming back up from Richfield, I mean, we've, we've kind of heard some things that we thought maybe we addressed that are still out there, yep. means that are still out there that we, uh, so we should, yeah. It sounds like we're doing what we're hoping yeah. we could. Well, yeah, the is all, so, well, I can give you an update at the Capitol Wednesday afternoon because we're meeting with them at lunch and then we'll have the interim meetings uh, that you're co-presenting with me at. So I can give you an update on what their list looks like. Uh, the other thing is we're sitting down with the board of the City Managers Association on Friday morning. Mm -hmm to talk through this research plan to make sure that what we are seeking is actually realistic and that the city managers can help us gather that, that information. Uh, there may be things on here that cities aren't tracking or there may be things that they're tracking digitally and we need to consider that, but we're trying to fight anecdotes with data, but also recognize that there may be places where cities are indeed falling short. And the, the leadership of the city managers association told us at their conference in April that and they were willing to hold their fellow cities accountable if we had good, trustworthy data that mm -hmm. illustrated that problem and we weren't just chasing anecdotes for the sake of chasing, yeah. anecdotes, chasing anecdotes. Gary, to, not to put you on the spot, but to put you on the spot, is there anything else uh, that you'd like to add on behalf of UCMA and the board meeting on Friday? Nope, I don't have anything to add. I think you covered it. Thanks. Hey. So the, uh, just two quick things, then we'll get to our discussion. Um, we're obviously going to have working groups that are looking at a lot of these issues. We'll have our LPC on June 6th. Um, that's where we'll present some of this to, to, to the wider uh, membership, the LPC uh, committee, um, which I know saying C there is redundant. Um, but um, if there are other issues that we haven't brought up that we're not looking at, um, that, that you think we need to have on our list somewhere, as always, please let us know. Um, these next couple of weeks are really when we're trying to define what the universe looks like. And then it says in Carson's memo, and, and I just want to reiterate it, it's ev if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. And so we need to make sure what the priorities are and where we want to spend the bandwidth, what we want to do the research on to get the most bang for our buck. Um, so if there are things we need, um, and number five, if there are resolutions uh, that, that you feel like would help us to define our policy platforms going forward, um, you know, we were talking this morning when it came to secondary water metering, um, we didn't really know where the line was necessarily. We knew it was a big ask and we've had debates about it over the years. Um, putting in $250 million certainly helped things, um, but we don't necessarily have a, a policy platform or resolution to fall back on when it comes to water conservation. So if there are things that we need to look at uh, there, 
then then please please let us know. I, I you know either now or always reach out uh, anytime and let us know uh, as we're going forward. Um, yeah. So I have one more thing. I was going to maybe bring this up under other business at the end, but um, I've had some conversations with some staff here about the requirement that the state auditor came out with yeah. to for for municipalities to basically uh, provide uh, real time information about how business license or uh, permitting fees for construction building licenses are being expended and things like that. And, and there's a real accounting problem there, given how that whole system works. Any updates on that? Or that's actually something that we don't get um, a, 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 a good response from the state auditor that we may need to look at trying to do legislation on, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the 30 second update is uh, we had a good conversation with Seth Obison, who's, who's the one in the auditor's office who's overseeing this. Uh, and then we sent back a written response. Uh, that we shared with uh, GFOA, with uh, the, the city managers, that we shared with municipal attorneys, um, and pushed back on the way that he was he was approaching that. So I haven't heard back yet um, any response since that public comment period closed, but that's absolutely one we're monitoring and, and going to push back on if they go down that road. And then, Merrill, like one other thing, that is on the top of the list for the Property Rights Coalition this summer is potential next steps from that bottom of and there's no question that it was from the property rights um, that that complaint got to the auditor, which then caused the, the notice to come out. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a thing where we could have a conversation about how the process works and how, I mean, the, what they're asking to do is really not feasible, given the way that, given what happens in the timing of it, I don't think. I mean, that's what my, that's what my building officials tell me, and that's what my, my finance director tell me, so. Yep. Yeah, so we, we've got that one on there, absolutely. So with that with that long, and I, I appreciate everybody's uh, patience while we went through that long definition of the universe that we're living in right now, um, we're going to get really specific about a couple of topics. And so, Cam, I'll have you start us off. Um, Perfect. Carson, before you leave the memo, will you just go to page 28 and 29 of the memo? Molly referenced this, but I really, I really want to, to emphasize it. You know, keep going down. So Justin and Molly and I presented to Laura Hansen about the findings on the governor's growth engagement um, strategy. This is going uh, no, go it's back before up. that. No, keep going. It, they're the big GOPB slides. No, keep going. Oh, there there yeah, are. We go. So just go, keep going up one more. Laura authorized us to share these with you, but you'll see that the deliverables and the outcomes are now almost word for word what Molly just presented to you because GOPB shifted considerably based on the feedback that came from our caucuses that Molly presented to them. You can also see the current time, the current timeline of the of the campaign strategy. Still a lot of still a lot of work to go here, but it's it's starting to come to fruition. And this, as a reminder, was the number one ask of our LPC survey results last summer was this exact sort of statewide conversation about growth. So take a look at it. We are the first entity to be able to share this publicly. And it's been informed considerably from league members over the last few weeks. I use that to set up what we're gonna spend the next half an hour on. And that is the policy discussion that we are anticipating before the UEOC at the shop. What we've tried to do internally as staff, and last year I think we, we achieved it and we'll continue this year, is to elevate the most important and most pressing issues for cities to discussion at the league board level. And then all other types of discussions are through the LPC or subgroups, but you know, picking those most important pieces. Yeah. Here. Leave that open. Yes. Yeah. 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 So Carson, if you can close that and bring up bring up the PowerPoint because we have heard comments both from our own members as well as from state leaders in this space and it's become clear to us as staff uh, and I said we should have had a video of Inigo Montoya saying I don't think this means what you think it means because everybody I talk to about this concept has a different perception of what it means now we don't expect to get to consensus in this room in the next half an hour but we do want to flesh out what what it means what this means when you as board members say it. So actually go back to slide to slide three right there. So this is what 
Justin referenced, you have the GOPB growth public engagement, so that's in your packet. And then the UEOC now has the CHA as a subgroup. We've been told repeatedly that they're going to be aggressive in their policy proposals and they want stuff fleshed out by October. So we had you know, over 200 days until the session starts, but far fewer than 200 days until October. The CHA has new co-chairs or will have new co-chairs in the session, which means a lot of institutional knowledge is walking out the door come January, which is a, which is a major bummer for us. So we've highlighted in orange the question that we're going to be, be asking of this group. Next slide. And that is DWS is tasked by state law by December 1st to establish and maintain a database of modern income housing units and develop and submit to the CHAW methodology for determining whether a municipality is taking sufficient measures to protect and promote modern income housing, which is defined as 80% area median income and below. Now, as a reminder, in a way we've done this with SB 34 and then House Bill 462 this past session, those are the strategies. In a way where what we're hearing from state leaders is they want a better understanding of potential outcomes. So I think it's important to recognize that SB 34 and House Bill 462 did not include certain outcomes such as quotas, which the California legislature did to cities. It did not include mandatory minimum densities, which again, the California assembly did to cities. Um, or a preemption of local land use processes or zoning, which the main legislature just did to cities and is under consideration in a litany of states from Arizona to Colorado, from Nevada to Massachusetts, North Carolina, Minnesota, the list goes on and on. In fact, there's a new email thread just this morning from different states with the National League of Cities reaching out looking for resources in this space. Uh, we often hear the term, our city is doing our part. Now, what that means is what we want to try to flesh out. We heard it at the board meeting last month. We heard it as part of the discussion in Salt Lake County around temporary over, temporary homeless overflow facility on retail incentives last year. I heard it repeatedly from cities saying this bill shouldn't apply to us because we're doing our part on housing. In the first CHAW meeting, the last week of April, this was the first item that they brought up. So they haven't even gone to other policy things, but said we need to do a better job of understanding that what cities are doing when it comes to doing their part, and we need to find this was the exact quote um, from uh, Representative Waldrop said the CHA should work through the nuts and bolts of these concepts, do a monthly check in with the UEOC, find an agreement that everyone can support of cities doing their part. Next slide. So, we as staff have started brainstorming okay, what does that actually mean? And this is where I'm going to stop talking in about 30 seconds. Somebody time me because we want your thoughts on what that actually means. Uh, on the left, you'll see we've highlighted what potential metrics could be in this space. So again, think of metrics as those out outcomes. The second question we have there is like, do cities actually control these? Uh, you know, we have long advocated against any state policy that would penalize cities for things we can't control. And then this third piece is even more complicated piece ranging from market forces to infrastructure, city's life cycle to incomplete data and how those pieces fit together with these potential metrics. Okay, I think I made my 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> barely, but yes. Barely, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Mayor Ramsey, I'll turn it to you to solicit feedback for the I, next 25 minutes. looking at the list going, yeah, this is not, these are all considerations and this is not easy it is crazy and we can't compare city a and city b we can't i mean this this really is going to be unique um but any opportunity we have to try to help um drive the methodology and inform um the methodology i think is going to be critical um because otherwise it will likely be something that maybe doesn't consider all of these things simply because um, if you've never sat in these seats, you may not even be aware of the difference of all of these things that might not come to mind, right? And so, what are your thoughts on this? So, so I, I want to maybe just test you a little bit on that idea that um, every city is different. There's no doubt of that. Um, but I think that when we when cities say we're doing our part, are they saying that? Uh, are they saying that with an eye toward what others are doing, or just they think? We've done enough, but we don't, or we just don't want to do more. I, I think it actually might be valuable for 
all of us to know what's going on in other communities to, to kind of measure ourselves, to, to really determine, are we doing our part? Are, are we doing, are we, are we, you know, using all the pieces that are available on the game board, basically? And, uh, and I don't think you hear, know that until you have conversations with other communities about what are you doing about this? So the, the, the database, if we can develop it, well, even if it's just along these categories, um, and there may be others, right? But, um, but at least that would give some of us an idea about, hey, how is my city doing, uh, you know, with respect to how much density are we really doing versus what somebody else may be doing? What is the standard on that, you know? And admittedly, you know, there's a, there is gonna be a difference between more rural, more urban communities and, and size of cities too, in terms of what your resources are and things. But, but I don't think you can really make that conclusion. We're doing our part without more information. The hard thing is what is our, what, is, what does that mean? If they're trying to show us all in a box and you know, if I say, okay, well, I'm doing, we're doing our part. Well, okay, all the variables that have to do with my community are, we have very few businesses. Nobody's employed there. I have no transit area. We have very little, very little uh, below the moderate income for the county we're in. You know, so our, to us is probably okay. Are we making ADUs more accessible? Are we in those zones that are appropriate for um, higher density housing? Are we using those for that? So, yeah, slapping and what is our look like? I think there's some things that that ratios and quantification can can be appropriate, but other things could be simply a direction where it's okay. We're increasing the amount of ADUs or smaller lots that are available. We're heading in a direction. We've increased it by 5% for this year. And then there's some who you don't even have land left. So yeah, wrapping, wrapping the concept of our, in this room, we have quite a diversity about it. And I look at it and think, yeah, we're in my town. We're not, we're not in a rush. And you think of, we were talking, you're talking about definitions. So we're on the same page and the easiest one for me is always, okay, high density in Mapleton is a third acre. It's a third acre. So let, when we say, oh, well, high density development, it, it's just, you know, we have eight units for an acre, like the most, and whew, that's pretty, pretty scary. So yeah, the, the hour is tricky, but I think there's something introspective about it to say, okay, well, if, if my community thinks we're doing our part, the first thing that needs to be happening is better, better education. So my community understands where really are the gaps and the needs, and um, especially in our surrounding communities, we're looking at Provo Springville, Spanish Fork, and, and all of the growth and uh, that's happening there is where does the hour fit into the greater community? So to me, there's a huge education element on it. There are some things we can quantify or some ratios for a few of these measures that might be appropriate across communities, but I also wouldn't want to leave out the concept of our could be a direction, a percentage mm -hmm. increase or a percentage of, uh, for, for us, ADUs are huge. When we were charging $5,500 for an ADU permit for a basement, I kid you not, that we, because we had a previous council who didn't want those, they considered ADUs density and, you know, I digress, but heading in a direction needs to be a measurable quantity as well. If I could just be back to the our thing, for, for a smaller community, we have a low income housing area. And I know most of the people that are in that. And I know only know two of those individuals who are from the area. Almost all the rest have actually come in from the Wasatch Front because it's less expensive. So if you, in a small community, if you're trying to provide for your own, and I'm sure with the Wasatch Front, when they, when they do special housing for the, for the homeless, then they have people streaming in from out of state. And so there are all of these challenges going with our, in terms of you know, taking care of your population. And again, I think because of monetary pressures in the last few years, you have people that are streaming out, even out into the county, or buying a little parcel of land and setting up a trailer. And, and that's getting sort of out of control in my county. And, and so there are many challenges with the housing crisis. And I don't know how you deal with that because 
we're sort of in an economically disadvantaged area. And yet we have, because of the movement in from out of state people who are selling their homes for a million dollars or whatever, and they're coming in and forcing up the prices so that the people that are growing up in, in that area that are native to that area can no longer afford to live there. And you can't really control those. No, you can't. And you, and you can't. And, it, and then it comes back to all the land use law too. So what the extent do you dictate someone that they have to have higher density when it's right. their land to develop? Yeah, lots of challenges. I have a question for the staff. So there's the cities that are required to submit your moderate income housing plans under SB 34. Mm -hmm. um, and I know our data coming back from DWS has been crappy. Mm -hmm. um, but have we ever asked them for the reports in a way that we could lay out on a graph of those cities that are at least required to do the report, which are the things that they're picking? Because I think that starts yeah. to get to your question there about perception of what hours. Oh, yeah, what are, yeah, so, so a certain set of cities are required to at least do that report. The smaller cities aren't having to do that report, but at least that would give us like, what do we think doing our part looks like? But what if we self-selected our part to be at least as a baseline? Um, and agree. So maybe we have that, or can, we go, can we make one or get the data? So, yeah, I was just going to say, we, we do have that information. Um, BWS is working on even revamping how they've been collecting that, um, because some cities will, they might be doing five things, but only report on three things, because those are the ones in their statutory requirement. But we have those general numbers for the 82 cities that are complying, that have to comply with SB 34. And then uh, the Gardner Policy Institute, I think they were for 2019 numbers, if I'm remembering correctly, we went and reviewed all the different reports and chose the strategies that were and reviewed the strategies that are most common. And they don't really get into the weeds of whether they're necessarily effective, but they may kind of uh, at least indicate what cities are choosing, what the trends are, and then they have some best practices along with like how to even start implementing those. So yeah, we're working with DWS to as DWS builds up their own internal database, we want to make sure we're partnered with them on both the hard data and the categorical data on what cities are doing. That'd be but, really valuable. But are they doing? I think that's where they, you know, we're, we're doing our part means we've we fulfilled SB 34. You know, I have submitted my report. These are our plans. These are how we're uh, we're we're making some changes in our city that probably won't ever happen. But we're making them available, and I think that we, that, that's my part. And I, I worry that that's kind of the mentality for a lot is that just uh, I'm doing my part, you know, state asked me for SB 34, I'm going to fill up my, uh, my modern income housing plan, I'm going to have that put together, and, uh, and there you go. Um, I'm good. I think that would be a good first step, though. Like, to just, I mean, it wouldn't be interesting if we knew that of those 80 plus cities, you know, 80 of them pick, pick the same, pick the same yeah. thing. And then we could look back and say like, okay, well, so five years ago, we were here, 80, 80 cities picked this. Did it move the needle on deeply affordable units? Did it, did it address housing variety? Did it address mm -hmm. um, rental housing? And if not, then that's part of, okay, maybe we actually aren't doing our part. Or maybe, maybe you check the box and you changed your ordinance, but you made it so expensive, no one could, would actually pick it. I don't know. But I, I worry that the states, I mean, they're kind of taking that approach anyway. I mean, here, here's SB 34. How are you going to handle that? We rolled out as part of our initial modern income housing. We rolled out ADUs. I said, you know what? We're going to do internal ADUs. We're going to, we're, we're going to make that happen. Then the legislature comes through and just mandates it. And, and it's like, okay, well, we're going to pick at you anyway, whether you came up with the plan. Um, we're going to pick those things and just make them mandatory. Of course, I did get the uh, report today from Biden that he's, he's fixed it. So um, <laughs> he's, he's submitted his, uh, his housing plan now. So Part of my concern at? is exactly what you said, though, about can we look back in five years? That would be a really wise way to do it. But we never get the five years. The five years doesn't exist, right? We've been doing SB 34 for a couple of years, and, and the data isn't showing 
enough of what they're asking. So the SP, SB 34 plus mm -hmm. idea came out. We had HB 462 and, and more ways to collect better data, and whatever. But I don't know that we're ever going to be given enough time to actually evaluate those metrics for additional policy. We don't have five years on this. Um, because I agree 100%. That's what we want to look back and make sure is this working. But we have new, more aggressive policy uh, recommendations that turn into policy that we're working to try to, you know, work with every session without really having time to do much evaluation. So the question, I guess, though, is how do we, how do we, because I agree, the legislature is not giving us time to see if anything works. Right. It's just we just throw new ideas at the wall every year. Um, and, and then we scramble to react, and then they throw new things at the wall, we scramble to react. So I guess the question is, is we're going to have to probably scramble to react um, to whatever UEOC brings out as their aggressive goals. But at the same time, we've got to find some underlying research that helps us say, put something in place and hit pause for a hot second to see if this makes a difference, because um, otherwise, we, we don't you know, know. We don't, we just don't. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to get to hit pause, but but one of the, one of the things that 462 did is to actually start collecting the data. So while we don't have five years yet, in five years we will. I'd love to have just two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, cycle. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we we will have one and two. You know, I mean, I hope hopefully that will be better. And, and the other thing is, I don't know if we're doing anything to work with DWS to make sure that, I mean, when they come up with these, I mean, as we're talking about right now, whether these are the right metrics, but but um, you better make sure we get a system that actually measures the measures this appropriately or we're still not gonna learn anything. Well, Mayor Silvestrini, that's part of the reason we put these metrics on the screen is DWS, it, they'd hired a staffer to start building a database, he left. So now they're in the process of hiring a new staffer so they're already going to be behind a few months, and we we are not expecting this first year to be data above and beyond what's been collected to date. Which is why internally we've made the call that we probably ought to collect some of this data on our own so that we can fill in that narrative. But I think this initial conversation of what does it mean to do our part really is the policy question that informs all the, the data outcomes because we, you know, does our part mean on homelessness, not every city will have a shelter, but what is the appropriate contribution from every city towards addressing homelessness or the appropriate nature for low income housing or current supportive housing? Like there are several metrics you can look at in the at the legislature, most of the metrics that they look at is market rate housing. And is there enough market rate housing? So that's why we're trying to take a step back and say, what are the other metrics that we ought to be looking at? And at question number two, what what do we actually control as cities? So so another category, I mean, this is somewhat covered under housing variety, but but you know, the moderate income, you've got, you know, deeply affordable housing, moderate, moderately affordable housing needs to be looked at too. I mean, that's another, I mean, in terms of having housing across the spectrum of affordability is, is something we all have to strive for. And, and frankly, it's, it, you can't just focus on the deeply affordable and ignore the middle either, so. And, and also short-term rentals, because that's really impacting the available housing. Yeah, I mean, it would be nice to get this that. state back. I mean, Representative Walter promised that they would be looking at that in the interim. Well, and, and I just got a text from the legislator who will be running short-term rental legislation. Now we're trying to set up the meeting. So yes, that is very much on the docket for this year. It's just a matter of what happens. We had some interesting conversations in Richfield about this, about, about short-term rentals in you know more rural communities and um and they were searching for how do you regulate them can you um limit limit them to certain uh numbers in your community or um I, certain numbers in, in council districts or you know i mean i don't think there's a really good clarity on that even you know but so, look, so legislation ought to look, try to look at that like how can you further permissible ways that are both, that both pass constitutional muster and 
accomplish the goal of ensuring that some of that housing remains available for for long-term rental to, to address the affordability issues. That's what we I, hopefully we'll get some have some input on that. Thank you. Anybody else have any thoughts as we round up this discussion? Just at least for today. <laughs> at least for this meeting. Yeah, we can go for another 15 minutes on this. We have more time. No rush out. Yeah. And there's no rush on this one. But I, I would love to hear, you know, on number two, can cities actually control those metrics? Um, so what are the things you feel like are in your control and which one of these metrics do you just feel like you have no control over at all? So let me see if you can control zoning. That's that, that's what cities can control. Cities can control if they, to some extent, incentives or penalties. But we can control zoning. Um, as I read through President Biden's proposal today or his, his intentions and the grants and incentives to allow for affordable housing or moderate income housing, however he chose to put it, um, every bit of it came down to zoning. And that's it's the only thing we as cities really control. We can control, and, and we should. That's the, the, that's the one thing that we do, and we do well, and we should do it. And it's the one thing that creates the city's uniqueness. And, and so to just kind of brush that aside and say, here's what cities ought to do, here's how zoning ought to happen, is is criminally wrong because that is the purpose of the cities is to develop and, and create a place. And we we can't we can't do anything as this body that would sacrifice that at all. I mean, we need to fall on the sword for that one because that's what we do. And that'll be the goal. That'll be the, the push. It, it's going to be the push. Is how do we take that out of the city's hands? We've already heard that this is the problem. Session that that was, uh, and in and, and in and in president's the, his memo today, it's how do we, he's pushing uh, as a huge part of it manufactured housing and having cities free up space for manufactured housing, uh, rehabilitating old housing for low income. The problem is the cost of housing. You know, we have developers as the, the vast majority of our leadership at this point. And not one of them is building affordable housing. That's not what they do. Even those that are building density. I mean, when when Brad gave up destination homes this year to, to Larry H. Miller, he kept the apartment portion. Not one of those are affordable apartments. I mean, he's not building a, a affordable housing. He's building market rate apartments. But yet, in the same legislative session, pushing for affordable housing. Mike Schultz is not building affordable housing. That's not what, and part of that is simply from a market perspective. One, it has to sell, it has to rent, and two, it's expensive to build anything right now and to make it affordable and to somehow say, I'm going to be able to build a house that fits within an 80% or 60% AMI. It is, I mean, it's, it's dang near impossible. We have a LIHTC project going up in Clearfield right now. Um, it is 100% LIHTC, about 300, 300 units between apartments and townhomes. The 80% that that has to reach, it's gonna be 80% of the AMI, that's what that was, it puts them making, as a couple, about 80,000 a year. They'll be full like that because everybody will qualify. And I mean, they'll, they'll be after the students, they'll be after everybody else, and it's, they'll rent for less, but they're not in what the state would have deemed the people that needed them. They'll still qualify, but that's not necessarily the need, which you can't. And until builders are truly, truly ready to develop that kind of product, and cities are willing to accept that kind of product, this doesn't fix itself, it's, it just can't. And to tell a city that they have to is one thing and, and that should never happen. But in order for that builder to build to that level, it means the quality of that product has got to drop from I mean, here to here because they cannot build it at a at, at what the rates cost or what things cost. They cannot build it in the, that, that point where it will be affordable and without completely sacrificing quality. And then it's, it's longevity is is not going to happen and you are building blight. And 
this should never happen. Mayor Ramsey, can I ask a follow up question? Yeah. Mayor Shepard, and then I want to make sure people have a chance. So, Mayor Shepard, one thing that I, mean, I think of that you said was, was gospel and terrific. One potential metric that came out of it is you mentioned the LIHTC project. Mm -hmm. And one question that we've asked the state is the distribution of LIHTC projects around the region. And we don't have that data yet. And that we're hopeful we can get that data because I think that could be an interesting metric to see are there more light tech projects in Clearfield compared to the rest of Davis County? Like it, that's my assumption, but it'd be nice to get that information. And it dovetails into a conversation I had with Farmington a few weeks ago where they were actually seeking light tech projects, but kind of get them because of some market well, pressures. The, the competition is huge. Yeah. The requirements of the developer to qualify for a light tech project are insane. And that is part of what President Biden rolled out today is that they will, they're, they're going to revamp the requirements on the light tech project. For the project. But unless they're throwing more money into it, it's still going to be in the same place. It's only like so many dollars. Somebody's still qualifying for it every year to, to use the funds. It's a, a very, very competitive program in, in Utah. And yet that's the first one we've built in 30 to, no, probably 30 to 40 years. We've had a light tech project built. So we control zoning and we and we control to some extent the fees. And I agree with you that even though, even if we make concessions on some of those things, there's not, there's rarely a guarantee that that translates to any kind of affordability. And 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 there, I think that's something that there could be legislation concerning that if there are breaks on impact fees or things like that, that that those things need to we need to figure out how to require that to be passed through to the consumer um, rather than just going into um, the developer's pocket is you know because the market doesn't require them to pass that on at all. Um, and then the other thing, other thing I add that cities can control in addition to the zoning is. Um, and this varies depending on the size of the community, but sometimes we can, sometimes we can, can our staffs can uh, direct people to some resources that may be available. And, and this is a Salt Lake County specific thing, but you know, Salt Lake County is put aside some of its ARPA money to basically subsidize affordability where the project is being built to get the developer to commit to, you know, offer so many units at a percentage of AMI for a period of time, at least to get that kind of prime the pump on, on, on that affordability. And I mean, obviously that money isn't long-term um, and, and uh, those units would, you know, I guess return to market rate at some point, but you know, but that, that requires a, somebody that's seeking a permit to talk to a city planner and, and the planner to say, hey, this, did you know this is available? And, and are you interested in reserving 20, 10% of your units in your project to, to, for this program that's being offered, you know, uh, to assure at least some affordability in your project? So that's the other thing, that, that's another kind of thing we can do. But admittedly, those resources are usually not ours to control. I mean, very few of our municipalities, some, some of them obviously have some of that, but the smaller ones don't. So, you know, we would have to be going out looking for other resources to be able to put these people together with. That's an yeah. interesting conversation though on the, the federal that opportunity zones a few years back, specifically for this person purpose to kind of help with those blighted areas and, and revitalize them and head to apply and head to get things put in there. So I spoke last week to our developers who have built now or are, are building or entitled to build within that, that opportunity zone, who put it into a fund. I mean that's Building there's one thing, but building and actually using the fund, and ask why none of them are why why they didn't target well, you know why did they target they didn't even target moderate I mean their their market rate two thousand dollar a month rentals, and the answer to that was in order to qualify on the opportunity zone to to get the benefit out of it you had to hold it for at least ten years and they didn't want to hold garbage, they didn't want to hold something that wasn't going to be past that ten year mark because they wouldn't be able to sell it. Yeah, we've had that kind of discussion where we talk to people about why, why, are, why isn't some element of your project owner occupied? You know, why, what, what, how can we get you to build condos or townhomes instead of just 
apartments and it's, it, it is that kind of thing. It, it, it's, a, it's the ability to finance and the time that they have to be holding the, the, the thing before cash flows. I see um, Mayor Walker's hand up. Before I go to him, one thing I, I want to add, um, coming from a city that has a master development agreement with a developer that still has more than 9,000 approved units to go, um, talking about B, entitled lots that are just not built units, and my friends to the south in Harriman, the entirety of Harriman has been entitled. Like there's going to be a gazillion more. Um, Riverton has so much entitled just in our little tiny corner pocket of the southwest part of the valley right there. <coughs> we can probably make up half of the shortage already just in that. However, it's not going to happen overnight and it's going to take years for the rest of daybreak to finish building out and they're busting out homes faster than we can hardly even keep up with it. It's still going to take time for that to finish, but I think looking at the entitled lots, because across the state, there are so many places where there's entitlement that has been approved, but not been built, at least along the Wasatch Front, there's quite a bit. 714 for them. See, there's We're a lot smaller, but. But there's a lot, there is a lot. And I know that I've heard before that if we take a look at what has been approved across the state, it is more than enough to make up the gap. Mm -hmm. But I do think that's something that needs to be, I mean, I, I'm, that's a soapbox I'll stand on all day long, you know. Yeah. So and that, and that ties into material shortages and yeah. labor, right. and labor, all yeah. of and the that, things that's we what's can't the, control. That's a lot of what's but have approved that housing, right? Yeah. But those We've done what we could, right? So that's just one thing I just want to point out. Um, Mayor Walker, you took the words right out of my mouth. That's what I was going to say because, <laughs> I mean, um, and, and then in addition, it's worse than that because. You have all these entitled units and i'm going to go back to my prime example i have a front runner stop where they had unlimited ability to build and they build four-story apartments and then they want to come over to the other side of the town and build four-story apartments and they use the same housing crisis as the you know as the basis that you know draper we're not we're not fair because we don't want to have more four-story apartments everywhere i mean i that's part of the what you said is it i mean we have entitled the cities enough property this isn't about affordable housing. It's about affordable profit. And it's about just more and more. And I, I'd like to see us somehow coalesce around, hey, build out the units that you have um, before we start tweaking everybody's zoning. I mean, we've, you know, lots of us have done lots of apartments and lots of density. And we've put, we've created areas for significant density and they have just, you know, thumbed their nose at the, at the creation. So, it's not just us. It's it's as much them as it is us. I mean, when I say them, I mean the developers are in that to make money. I get it, it's America, but you know they wrap themselves in this housing crisis, and it's and it's you know they're not having a crisis. They're they're killing it. It's a great situation for them. They're they're crushing it, and and we're getting blamed for it. So anyway, well said, Mayor. On it back to them. Mm -hmm. What are their sufficient me measures on the <laughs> Well, no, that, so, yeah, no, that is a good point. Mm -hmm. And that this is where the absence of data is more harmful to us than it is to other stakeholders. And that's what we're trying to backfill. And I want to come back to question number two, the title in, in orange here. Recognize we only have a few more minutes here, but the homelessness or, or related deeply affordable housing, the type of units that the market doesn't produce. I mentioned that we asked the state about light tech credits. Uh, we, Molly and I met with uh, Niederhauser. What day was that? That was last week, right? They all blend together. <laughs> sure. Uh, last week. Yeah, sounds right. Uh, and we were, it was last we were Wednesday, looking. Yes, it was day winter. So, and we were talking about additional data points in the deeply affordable space. Recognizing there's, you know, there's not always a connection between zoning and deeply affordable units, but recognizing that right now we, when we think about metrics and what communities are doing and for their part for deeply affordable housing, transitional housing, and homelessness, there, you know, what do people think of? Looking at these metrics, uh, doing a, at least as lead staff doing a deeper dive on these types of metrics, so that we have a better sense of what's actually happening on the ground in communities. Not to beat a dead horse, but going back to the entitled lots, I think that is something that if we have really good data about that, 
um, it isn't anecdotal. That is saying, mm -hmm. this is how Bountiful has this many. If everyone has this many, um, they haven't been built, but here's a list of the communities in the state. Here is data about what has been improved. How, here's what's entitled. I think I think that's data that we can stand on. And it's, with respect to this homeless, with respect to this homelessness issue. Go ahead. Well, with respect to this homelessness issue, you know, as maybe some of you cities that aren't in our in our Salt Lake County area, our, our conference of mayors was tasked um, through good negotiation on the part of our league at the last session with with determining homeless overflow shelters. And, um, you know, we're, we're actually scoring uh, all the submitted homeless shelter proposals this week. And we're going to see how well we all cooperate. Um, because, you know, we talk about cooperating, doing our part. Well, this, this is going to be a defining week for, you know, everybody doing their part as far as, um, you know, what we're asked to do. And I guess if we can do our part, then the legislature doesn't need to watch over us. But if we can't, they might just watch over us. So, I mean, when we talk about doing our part, um, we need to really maybe focus in on what that, that means. I kind of, like, like what Kate was saying, let's figure out exactly what we're doing. What Jeff was saying, let's figure out what we have, what we're doing. So, so we can show each other what your part is, what you're, what you've done. Can I take your card at the Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Anyone else have any other thoughts before we? Oh, we've got some. Wrap up. Let's see. Go back up to start with Gary Hill. I, I agree with Don. I would really like to be able to share entitled units with legislators. Um, Mayor Monson. From a small city, we are open to the idea of doing our part when it comes to housing. Our problem is the same problem everywhere else. It's having a much smaller scale. We cannot get a developer to take a job down here in rural Utah. It's not worth it for them to take a job here. Our small contractors are lined up for years, so we stay on a standstill. We have some room to grow at a slow rate, but there is no real incentive to come here. Thank you. Thank you both for that input. Well, then the legislature to create some incentive to go there. If they want to start doing some incentives, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Create some incentives to move it off the, out of the Wasatch Front. That could be another element of it. Because you hear that, but let's, yeah, that's great. Go ahead. So, Mayor Ramsey. You need to run for the Senate. <laughs> um, the great one, uh, Mike Caldwell, has always said to me, we need to scare where the puck, where the puck is going and not where the, the puck currently is. And uh, I can't see his face on the screen, so I'm hoping he's chuckling. Can you explain that to him? Come on, that's a sports <laughs> reference. I get it. Yeah, it's when you tennis thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the old tennis puck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also incredibly bitter about the NDA right now, Molly, but I'll spare you. I'll spare you this piece of... Because of downtown? <laughs> but, okay. but we know based on on the rhetoric that this is where this is where the puck is going now i had to mix metaphors i actually think there are a bunch of people who aren't playing hockey right now they just know the puck's going they're trying to figure out where it's going part of the reason we wanted to have this discussion and we'll continue this discussion with this board and with the members over the next few weeks is we're trying to figure out how to best defend cities, but also be proactive for cities so that if you have a scenario where, you know, Cameron City is not doing their part. Cameron City never does that. Cameron City never does. That's why I pick on Cameron City. I made the mistake with the Great Metro rec program, City though. That's it. It's just it's, but if Cameron City is not doing our part, but South Jordan and Provo are, and, but Cameron City is driving the narrative of the capital, then South Jordan and Provo are using political capital to defend Cameron City from not doing their part. So what we've been trying to figure out is like, what does it mean to do our part in these different categories? And the feedback has been helpful today. We're going to keep digging on some of these data points when we sit down with the city managers on Friday. This is part of that discussion because at the end of the day, the CHA and the UEOC are talking about this. And we think it's better to steer them rather than just to wait and react to what they come up with. And in many ways, the foundation of SB 34, now Fort House Bill 462, lays the foundation for this type of 
direction, short of quotas or certain types of mandates. And I think the, the outcome on 462 was really vital in that we got to a point where the state didn't dictate to Provo what your zoning should be around BRT. Instead, it said, here are these objectives. Provo, you figure out what makes sense. And the good news is Provo was already figuring out what was making sense in those different areas. Uh, but for Cameron City that maybe wasn't being as proactive, now they're on the clock to be more proactive. So the Provo City isn't spending political capital to defend Cameron City's inaction. So my request of the board members is, is the following. We'll send this PowerPoint out as part of our board recap email because this hit you blind today. Like we put the question in the document. We didn't put these intentionally because wanted to kind of spur the conversation. If you have additional thoughts, email them to staff and then we'll probably revisit this again in June as well as have the focus group discussion on, on water conservation. Because in a way, it's the same conversation. We've heard lots of things say, hey, we're doing our part on water conservation. But what does what does that mean? What do we think it means? What does the state think it means? What do residents think it means? And how do these pieces fit together for potential public policy? Mary, is there any, I see one more note in the chat box. Was there anybody else online or in the room who wants to make a comment on this piece? No, thank you, Mayor Mendenhall, for being here. Can I make a request to staff that as we as we start to gather and specifically what I've talked to the, uh, the most is be the entitled lots that are not mm -hmm. just you know not built yet but are entitled uh, as we. Um, can we work toward gathering really good data and not wait for me to be able to present that as a as a comment in response to the presentation at UEOC, but can that information be given to Medhart far in advance and be part of their presentation? So it's not just me using that to defend against the entire presentation that's just been made that cities aren't doing whatever. Um, but if that information can be part of what they know in advance, I can still speak to it, speak in defense of it, but if they know that before I'm bringing it up, just sounding like we're defending cities with this information that they don't have, if, if information like that can, get to the UEOC and be be there to the point where it's part of the presentation that they're making with as they talk about this. I would appreciate that. Absolutely. We work on that. Thank you. Terrific. Well thank you everyone for the feedback. Again, your homework will be look at this slide, notify league staff if you have additional thoughts on any of these three questions, and then we'll have a follow-up discussion with the water conservation piece. Um, and approving the budget on June 13th. Then the board will now meet in July. So really June through August is our time as staff working with work groups to prepare resolutions for the policy platform and to be fleshing out some of these proposals. Justin mentioned that we submitted a variety of topics to the UEOC for consideration, Mayor Ramsey. They included regulation of short-term rentals. They included local revenue streams for infrastructure like clarification on the transportation utility fee um, and a variety of other topics that are in this in this growth space uh, in order to help cities plan for and accommodate growth. So we had to submit that list last week, but it's consistent with what we presented today and what we heard in our LPC survey last year, but maybe didn't address in the last legislative session. So the UEOC will meet on 25th. Yeah, so interim is the next couple of days, UEOC on the 25th, LPC on June 6th, and then the board again on June 13th, and then we'll have the summer break as we'll be working through different subgroups. Justin, anything else you want to add on the policy front before? Um, just one quick update on water. Um, just so that you're aware, um, the, the deadline to apply for secondary water metering uh, was yesterday. Um, they don't have the final numbers yet since there was so much that came through, uh, but over 70 applications and over $200 million in requests. If you recall, there's $250 million appropriated with that. If there are additional funds left over, they will open up a second application um, in the next few weeks. Um, but but chances are very high by the end of June, all the money will already be gone. Uh, so that's, that's quick. But also in the slides, we reference a few articles there. I'm sure there will be more articles in the next month about drought and water conservation. Uh, but this is something that we need to be talking about and thinking about all the time. I know you all are, but uh, but be ready for that one next month. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for the conversation. We'll have a lot more of these conversations.
Okay, Cam, Executive Director Report. Perfect, this will be quick. So thank you again to Mary's Ranch and South Stream for attending the Six County AOG Regional Training. We had almost 200 city officials there from around the region. Mayor Ramsey, thank you for attending the Conference of Mayors up in Cash Valley Saturday night. Fantastic. It was great. Mm -hmm. I really feel like I learned a lot. We're talking about water, because we're talking about growth. The mayor of Menden told me there's a, a landowner who is looking at doing an annexation. And, and if, if that all comes together and they get 100 more acres annexed into their community, it would be about 93 more homes, keeping in mind where that is and that they've got larger lots and it's more of an agricultural area. Um, but he said, and I know compared to what's going on in the Wasatch Front in your city, that 93 homes is going to sound like a lot of growth. And I said, um, for a community your size, you better believe that. So I, you know, just put it to scale. It's a lot of growth. And it talked to several mayors, talked about sewer, talked about garbage, talked about real challenges that you're all facing. Very valuable. Well, yeah, thank you for that. And that's, those are two events last week that are examples of the calendar that our staff has built for the first time. Of all of the AOG meetings, all of the comm meetings, all of the city manager regional meetings. Uh, right now, the spreadsheet has 156 meetings in it for the next few months. Obviously, we're not going to get to all of them, but we are trying to make sure that we as staff and uh, Mayor Ramsey in particular, but league officers in general, are meeting with as many of our members as possible over the next few weeks and months, gathering feedback on the policy concepts that are out there. Um, Mayor Monson, I want to follow up with you after this meeting, so I'm just putting you on notice uh, to talk about events in your neck of the woods, or better put, your neck of the desert. Uh, we're looking at <laughs> doing an AO, attending the AOG meeting in Price, uh, but you had an extended invitation to come down to, to Blanding at some point, so I just want to follow up. So I'll give you a call on that. Is Mayor Randall on? Yeah. Okay, I'll follow up with her too, because about yeah. Washington County. But at this point, we now have information about every corner of the state. So board members will follow up with you as we're building this out. Um, like I did so with Mayor Tran before board being started about the Davis Cog. So Mayor Shepard, I'm hoping to make it to the Davis Cog this week. Um, so anyway, we'll follow up with, with you as we're as we're building out this uh, this engagement calendar. But again, it's back to the, my comment on the budget and the vote of confidence. By allowing us to expand our staff, we're able to do more policy research. We're able to do more of this type of engagement and have more bandwidth on the advocacy side to represent cities. So uh, thank you for your direction today. And we look forward to continuing the discussion in the weeks ahead. Mayor Ramsey, I'll turn it back Cameron, to you. Can I just say, we appreciate that because we need that assistance now more than ever, especially those cities that don't have a lot of staff on board. So thank you so much for the training and the other advice that you provided. So, Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody have anything else to bring up? Oh, oh I do have one. Um, the I serve on the uh, Utah Outdoor Adventure Commission on behalf of the league. Um, we will shortly all be getting a request for information about any trails master plans or um, outdoor recreation components to your general plan. Um, part of the role of this commission is to gather this type of information for a state database counties are going to get the same request um, ultimately this will all flow into how much funding the state puts into outdoor recreation uh, grants and those types of things so um, hopefully i'm going to have something that will go in one of the friday updates um, but don't like when you see it don't forget to like forward it to your staff or someone to actually take action on because that's one of the big missing data points is that they really thought that counties would have all of this information. And until I told them that counties absolutely would not, they would need to use them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? All right, seeing then just a quick reminder that next month our uh, meeting date has changed to. Uh, because of Juneteenth, we moved it up a week, so it'll be June 13th. I will not be here in person. I'll be doing this online remotely from San Antonio, from the American Water Works Association Conference. Um, so I'll see you online next month. Somebody does be, water? Huh? Somebody does water? Fan Are you bringing some back? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I've never attended this, but like I haven't ever been here, but it's... Anyway, it's not pretty water. I've been there just saying. I don't know. I'm, so. I'm going representing the Jordan Valley Water Conservancy. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and I 
represent my city on that board. So we'll find out, but I will see you from my hotel room in San Antonio um, on June 13th. And LPC, you said LPC is June 6th? The 6th, yes. Okay. For anybody yeah, that likes to attend the trust or the hybrid option. Yeah. Okay. If there's nothing else, um, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. All in Sorry. favor? Sorry. Aye. I'm going to ask for it. Aye. Okay, good. We are <laughs> Thank you so much.